Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, we're going to be talking about um, allergic uh, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis today, and uh, we'll try to look at some of the evidence behind uh, some of the things that we do. Um, pretty interesting topic. Um, so these are the topics uh, under which we're going to um, look at this um, disease. Um, and then we'll see. So let's talk about aspergillus. Um, it's an organism that's pretty much everywhere. It's a mold. Um, it's so abundant that wherever you go, there's going to be some exposure to aspergillus. Um, this can come up in uh, clinic visits when people talk about, oh, I had, I had uh, exposure to mold. There's mold everywhere. Um, it's not something you can really avoid. Um, the spores are pretty small, to so the three microns, which, um, looking at our airway anatomy, that would go pretty far down the uh, tracheobronchial tree. Um, the, they remain airborne for quite uh, extended periods, and eventually, if you're lucky, you end up inhaling some. Um, the way it causes problems is that it uh, grows in the airway and uh, germinates and leads to um, allergic problems in this case uh, for the um, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So, um, aspergillus itself was first described in 1979, 19, 1729, I'm sorry, um, it was first associated with human disease in the mid 1800s. Uh, this was the woman who was dying of an unspecified lung condition. It's classic for a condition you don't recognize. You call it unspecified. Um, we have uh, two of the greats in medicine, uh, Vecho and uh, Osler, um, who described patients um, who had what was later thought to be um, aspergillosis. It seems these gentlemen were pretty much uh, involved in everything uh, to do with medicine at the time. Um, one of them was a young woman who coughed for uh, 11 years, uh, coughed up sputum, which was um, pretty rich in uh, um, tissue um, with aspergillus. Um, and then it, the allergic component to aspergillosis was first uh, described in 1952. Um, eight patient case series, uh, almost all of them were asthmatics. Um, and at the time, uh, looking at the paper which uh, they used when, when they described it, they really didn't know what it was. They just raised uh, a two-line question. It, could it be that this is allergy to um, aspergillus and left it at that? And over the years, that kind of um, developed into uh, something um, else. Um, da -da 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 -da. I left this slide in. Um, sometimes it's good to know your enemy. That's um, the aspergillus organism itself with uh, lots of spores. Um, now think about that. When that detaches, it just kind of like circulates in the air. They are really small. They are really light. Um, they last forever. Um, Aspergillus itself um, causes a host of um, diseases in humans, and uh, it's pretty much a very wide spectrum. Um, based um, the multiple parts of it, you have the um, person who's completely asymptomatic, doesn't ever develop any disease, and then you have the uh, cavitary um, lung disease, um, and then you have patients who are immunocompromised who develop invasive disease, and then you have uh, those who have a large um, allergic component who previously might have developed um, things like asthma and uh, other um, atopic um, conditions, they tend to develop um, allergic uh, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So it's pretty much a, there's a predisposing component to um, developing this um, disease. And one way to look at it is um, as a spectrum. Um, as always, it's well, not always as frequently is the case. It's dependent on the host rather than uh, the exposure. Everybody does get exposure, but what happens is um, what the host um, looks like. So for those who have a, a normal immune um, response, nothing happens. They simply get rid of it and move on with their lives. And uh, for those who have uh, immune compromise, 
there you have the um, invasive uh, spe uh, spectrum of disease. And for those who have a large hypersensitivity component, they have um, asthma and um, as allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, so going to the epidemiology, um, it's pretty much a disease of patients who have asthma. And um, it's been described, in, the more severe your asthma is, the more likely it is that you do have um, a BPA. Um, not necessarily dependent on one dependent on the other, more like the ABPA makes the asthma worse. Um, and uh, 2 to 14 percent of patients with uh, cystic fibrosis, not a patient, not a po uh, patient population that we see a, a lot of. Um, it's also been reported in other non cystic fibrosis patients, but it's pretty rare. Um, there's no racial or sex predilection and uh, commonly occurs in the third to fourth um, decades of life. A lot of the time it gets diagnosed pretty late. The average person who gets uh, diagnosed with ABPA surprisingly has had it for about 10 years. That's quite a long time to have suffered with this, uh, with this um, disease. Um, now, how does it cause problems? Um, you have the spores, which we um, just saw. The average person inhales uh, probably about two to 300 spores a day, every day, you inhale spores. Um, and this grow in the um, tracheobronchial tree, um, leading to um, the release of um, chemokines, which might cause uh, decrease uh, mucociliary clearance. Um, there is the natural uh, innate uh, immune response with the macrophages and the neutrophils attempting to clear this um, infection. But as often is the case, that only leads to uh, dissemination of uh, the um, cell wall components of the of the um, mycelia of the uh, aspergillus organism. Now that then leads to release of uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and substances, causing a lot of um, injury to the airway and um, just kind of like a um, positive uh, feedback uh, mechanism. And eventually there's some hyperreactivity and uh, airway um, disease. Um, in the normal host, the response is the activation of the Th1 and Th2. The Th1 pretty much functions with the uh, macrophages and neutrophils like we talked about. Um, there's uh, phagocytosis and production of uh, immunoglobulins um, humoral response. Uh, the Th2 response um, leads to the um, allergic uh, component with activation of the um, IL-2, IL-4 and 5, um, which leads to activation of uh, eosinophils and uh, persistent um, release of um, uh, bronchoconstrictors and uh, vasodilators, which are now manifested as the symptoms of asthma. So it's not necessarily, once again, that the patient has very bad asthma. It's that the patient has asthma that's complicated with um, allergic uh, bronchopulmonary uh, aspergillosis. Um, this is um, some kind of um, a flow chart of uh, what we just talked about. You inhale, it grows, um, release of proteases, and um, eventual um, damage to the airway leading to bronchiectasis and lots of um, viscous uh, secretions. Um, similar um, flowchart, but more just graphics. Now, in terms of the clinical findings, um, it's not really a single um, um, presentation pattern. Um, it could present in multiple ways. Uh, for some people, it's just uh, uncontrolled asthma. Uh, with a high index of suspicion, you may be able to find it. Uh, with some people, um, when you do the um, x-rays and CTs for other reasons, you find bronchiectasis and then you wonder what's going on and eventually uh, find out that this person has uh, ABPA. Um, the symptoms are symptoms of asthma in addition to um, occasional fever, um, airway hyperreactivity, which will come under asthma as well, and cough productive of mucoid sputum. Um, there's a lot of um, like viscid brown and dark colored uh, sputum. Hemoptysis does occur, but it's um, relatively rare and uh, may lead to a diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis disease in um, more um, TB prone areas, 
when you see hemoptysis in a third world country, for example, the first thing that comes to your mind is TB, TB, TB. May not necessarily uh, be the case. Um, the physical exam is often normal um, or may just uh, mimic a physical exam of uh, an asthmatic patient. For laboratory um, diagnosis, um, most uh, important thing is uh, the blood work, which we'll go over in a minute. Uh, skin sensitivity testing um, is also done, but that's not necessarily very um, reliable, um, depending on where you get your the um, allergen from. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of variation in the um, response to the allergen, even from different manufacturers, even when you make them in house based on the amount of um, um, immunogenic um, material in what um, on what this um, product is. Um, peripheral eosinophilia may also be present, and it's usually present. Now, the radiologic findings um, for chest X-rays, um, what you tend to see um, is a lot of uh, upper and middle um, lung field disease. Um, you may find some transient infiltrates, which may be there very briefly and go away. Um, mucoid impaction, bronchiectasis, and uh, fibrotic changes in very persistent and uncontrolled disease. Um, CT changes um, generally show central bronchiectasis. And there's something called the paraspinal muscle sign, uh, which is the presence of um, high attenuation uh, mucus, which is denser than the um, paraspinal muscle. Um, it's pretty much pathognomic for us, um, ABPA. Um, once you see it, then there's a very high likelihood that the patient does have ABPA. Um, I've included some of these um, findings. Um, finger and glove um, appearance, um, which we often see at x-ray conferences. And then that's the um, high attenuation uh, mucus. Um, if you compare that to the paraspinal um, muscle, which is the muscle next to the spine, um, it's more denser. Um, lots of bronchiectasis in the other um, image over there. Um, so, the diagnostic criteria have pretty much evolved um, over time. Um, when it was first described, it was just a, uh, kind of like an afterthought. Um, the first, um, there's, there's no universal agreement in what to use um, to diagnose between um, people in Europe or people in the US or, or any of the other countries. Um, there's no single best diagnostic test that you can say, oh, I did this test and this man has um, ABPA. Um, the first um, set of criteria was uh, proposed in 1977. It was modified a couple of times until it was recently um, readdressed uh, within the last uh, four or five years. And the next slide shows the um, Rosenberg criteria, um, which looks a little bit busy, and uh, you have to satisfy uh, different conditions in the major criteria and the uh, minor criteria and kind of um, mix and match to make the diagnosis. This was um, recently readdressed and um, was simplified uh, such that you had about uh, five criteria. Um, presence of a predisposing factor and um, you have to meet the major, the upper three and then uh, possibly the other two. Um, treatment goals, um, to make it simple, um, the two major avenues to go. Um, first avenue is to decrease inflammation, which we use steroids for. Everything goes away with steroids. Um, the second um, avenue is to um, reduce the fungal burden, um, which makes sense, like um, Junior talked about a minute ago. There's no point adding, trying to treat the inflammation when the um, antigenic burden um, it's pretty high and increasing. Um, there is no trial data to support um, those of or durational treatment. Nobody really knows. Studies never got done, and they are probably never going to get done now. Um, for inhaled corticosteroids, uh, they're not really of any use um, for ABPA, surprisingly. 
um, and then for antifungal therapy, um, itraconazole is the most um, frequently used medication, uh, just based on the fact that it's chronic therapy um, often lasting as long as uh, six months, and people are ketoconazole side effects are much higher. Um, there have been case reports um, for the use of um, inhaled, inhaled amphotericin B and uh, inhaled uh, steroids. So now just to give uh, some kind of uh, graphic uh, description um, of the points at which you can um, intercept uh, the, this um, disease condition. Um, the glucocorticoids um, decrease inflammation and uh, try to block the um, effects, bronchoconstriction. Um, you can use um, the antifungals uh, to decrease the, um, fung the um, antigenic burden like we talked about. Pretty much if you kill off all the um, aspergillus, then there's nothing left to cause um, release of antigens. And there have been talks of the use of um, IgE um, uh, monoclonal antibodies um, to reduce um, inflammation as well. Okay. So just to go over the um, ATS uh, treatment guidelines, uh, most of the other uh, professional organizations have no formal guidelines for the treatment of um, ABPA. Um, so the goal of um, treatment is to um, prevent and treat acute excitation and the prevention of uh, end-stage fibrotic disease. This was often a very prolonged um, management strategy. This is not the kind of thing that goes away in two weeks. You will often have to follow patients for months and years. Um, the systemic steroids are the cornerstone. They're pretty much the only thing that has been well validated for the uh, use of um, for treatment in ABPA. Um, there are multiple regimens. Um, initially, you start off with a higher dose and then kind of taper um, as the patient um, tolerates and as the um, disease condition is able to um, be controlled. Um, for those who either do not meet the criteria for diagnosis or those who have um, had a good response to treatment, you're going to have to keep following them for months and months. I couldn't find any um, reference to how long before you say, okay, you're, you're cured now, you may go home. Um, so it seems like it's pretty much there's a lifetime risk of developing this disease once you've had it. Um, you may also start uh, mitraconazole um, and the um, role of anti-IG therapy is not currently well established. There have been studies that have been done, but um, it's not been like it's not made its way into the guidelines um, yet. Um, in terms of monitoring, this is kind of like a um, flow chart that we can use um, to follow the patients if they're stable. Yes. Correct. So there is no definite uh, period, and these are the, these are pretty much lifted from the guidelines. There is no definite period um, to continue the pre-exacerbation dose. But I asked myself that question when I was pre preparing the slides. What does pre-exacerbation dose mean? If it, this was a person who came in and you diagnosed him with ABPA and he wasn't on steroids, so you can taper him to be off steroids eventually. Um, not necessarily. If you have treated the patient satisfactorily, um, so when when you start treating, I'll come to that. But let me address this now. When you when you start treating, you have a baseline that you start off with, and then you follow that as you move forward. Um, over time, you would kind of establish some kind of baseline, new baseline. You're probably never going to be able to go back to zero or normal uh, limits, as long as he's doing well symptomatically and he doesn't necessarily technically meet the, the criteria for um, ABPA, then you can leave that person stable at that point and continue to monitor. Like I said, there's no 
defined period to continue to monitor these people for. Um, so it's something you're going to have to wing. Okay. So, um, so you kind of follow them uh, intermittently um, just to make sure that they are still doing okay. Um, you probably never be able to say you've cured a person of uh, ABPA. Um, so this is pretty much the um, the study on which most of what we do is um, is based. The small study was done somewhere in the 2000s. Um, came out of Boston. Um, so it was. Um, two-phased um, double-blinded randomized uh, control trial. It was pretty well designed. Um, their target um, sample size initially uh, to be adequately powered was um, 68, but they were only able to recruit um, 55. And that's just because it was so slow recruiting these uh, patients that they decided to go ahead and um, analyze their data and turned out to be viable. Um, the first phase had uh, double-blind itraconazole at 200 milligrams twice daily um, against placebo for 16 weeks. And then the second phase, all patients were treated with itraconazole for, for 16 weeks, 200 milligrams twice daily as well. So apparently some people got itraconazole for a 32-week period and some people got for the second um, 16, 16 weeks. And they didn't have any patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, they did some um, some um, laboratory um, testing at uh, the point of uh, study entry, and that's 16 and 32 weeks, and uh, chest X-rays and uh, every eight weeks for um, 32 weeks. So this was what they used as their response uh, criteria: um, reduction in dose of steroid by 50% or more. And this is based off your normal uh, asthma stepwise um, therapy. You try, I've never tried to give a person more steroids than they need. Um, and then um, decrease in total Ig by at least 25%, and at least one of uh, increased exercise tolerance improvement by 25% in their PFTs and uh, resolution of uh, infiltrates present at enrollment. Um, we have the uh, baseline uh, characteristics of the patients on the left and. Um, rates of response on the right. Uh, they found that um, they were able to decrease um, the rates, the use of um, the corticosteroid doses, and um, overall response, there was a significant difference between the uh, itraconazole group and the um, placebo group, um, which was what was um, expected. So um, using the endpoints they said, 46% of those who um, received the trepanazole um, met the treatment endpoints compared to 19% of those who received placebo. Now, one thing I should mention is that in this condition, some people, some patients will resolve on their own anyway, regardless of what you do. Um, of those who didn't respond um, during the 16-week um, initial period, um, one third of them responded in the latter half. And there were no relapses during the trial, 32 weeks. That's kind of like a tricky statement because, like we talked about, some patients got itraconazole for all 32 weeks. You wouldn't necessarily expect a, uh, a relapse in those patients. And the other patients got itraconazole for the second 30, 16 weeks. So they are actively on, on um, therapy at the time. Um, so there were a couple of problems with this um, study. Um, there were no patients with cystic fibrosis, which probably make up a greater proportion of the patients who get uh, ABPA. Um, and there were quite a few adverse um, effects. Um, so I don't imagine that um, compliance was um, very high. Um, greater than 80% of the study participants had adverse effects, none of which was enough to stop uh, medications. Um, they did not measure any um, itraconazole levels, which is uh, part of the recommendations. And um, we did not, through the study, we were not able to determine the optimal dose or duration of therapy. 
Uh, one thing to mention is that the, the because we don't know the levels, normally when you're given nitroconazole, you should follow the levels over time because of uh, genetic um, variations, um, which, will which will affect the effective uh, serum levels. Um, we don't know if those who did not respond had those genetic uh, variations or, or otherwise. And um, those and duration of therapy was not um, determined. Um, going back to the next, um, there are a couple of other studies, none as, um, as um, important as that one. Um, this study was um, done to compare the use of uh, medium dose steroids or high dose um, steroids for treatment of um, ABPA. Um, and what they did was that they used 0 0.75 milligram per keg um, for six weeks and then tapered down um, as compared to 0 0.5 milligram per keg for one to two weeks and then uh, tapered uh, down. Um, this was a randomized control trial. Um, so subjects who were treatment naive, newly diagnosed, never been on uh, antifungal therapy and hadn't received any um, steroids for the past uh, three weeks, for more than three weeks in the last six months were enrolled. Patients who required use of antifungals at the same time were also excluded. And um, this is where the um, results, and the only results that you can find that are significant are percentage decline in Ig after six weeks of treatment, and those who had high dose steroids um, were the ones who had a higher decline which is expected, steroids would reduce the amount of um, Ig and the side effects. Um, so those who had higher doses of um, steroids had higher um, um, incidence of um, side effects as well, um, which you would also expect. And the um, outcomes of this um, study, well, uh, medium dose steroids are pretty much as effective as um, higher dose. Um, but the higher dose led to more side effects. So at the end of the day, you were only you only had one option to continue using the lowest possible dose that uh, would achieve your your desired outcomes. Um, there were no cystic fibrosis patients again, and um, a very large number of patients were lost um, to follow up. So we don't know if the reason why they were lost is because they were doing much better and just kind of uh, disappeared. But it turns out that both sides, both arms of the trial had pretty um, equal numbers who were lost um, to follow up. And um, there were no quality of life um, indicators uh, measured uh, in this study. Um, next study which was done was um, role of inhaled corticosteroids. Now, this, this studies were not done in any particular, um, the, and this, in this um, presentation, they're not arranged in any particular chronological order. So here, what they did was that they uh, took 21 patients who met diagnostic criteria for ABPA, who refused treatment with oral corticosteroids and itraconazole, and um, enrolled them. A lot of the reasons why they refused treatment, why they were classified as refused treatment, was um, basically because they couldn't afford the medications. This study was done in India. Um, patients were treated with a combination of formoterol and budesonide and followed at 6, 12, 18, and 24 weeks. And if Ig levels were not controlled at six months uh, of uh, therapy, um, they started them on uh, oral corticosteroids. And they found that. Um, there was some improvement in patients who were treated with inhaled corticosteroids, um, but none had good control of their asthma, which is expected because you have continuous um, antigenic uh, stimulation. Well, the most important finding was that after six months of therapy, the median Ig levels had risen by 99% uh, in most of these patients. Um, and then after that, they did have to initiate um, oral corticosteroids and there was complete resolution of asthma symptoms in 19 out of 21 patients. And Ig levels fell uh, by 52% median after six weeks of initiation. Um, the median duration of follow-up was about 15 months, which is pretty long. And 18 patients achieved complete remission, which is defined as remission greater than three months. Um, 
and three patients had relapsed in 15 months, which is pretty decent. So this is kind of like a um, plot of the um, Ig levels um, for these patients, and right about the initiation of oral steroids. Prior to the initiation of oral steroids, you had a progressive climb in um, in the Ig levels. Um, which of course makes sense, like we talked about, you have persistent um, antigenic uh, stimulation. And eventually, as soon as you introduce oral steroids, the levels uh, pretty, pretty much fail. So the um, final conclusion was that um, inhaled corticosteroids by themselves have no role in the management of ABPA, um, but can be used as additional control of asthma. So just giving a person inhaled corticosteroids doesn't really help them. Um, for the control of um, AB, ABPA. I tried to find um, studies where they did inhaled corticosteroids and um, oral antifungal therapy, and I wasn't able to find any, any um, such th um, um, studies. Okay, so let's go to uh, inhaled antifungals. You have very li limited data, um, very few studies for some reason. Um, the largest series that we had had only seven patients in cystic fibrosis uh, uh, patients. But there was quite a bit of benefit. 17 out of um, 19 patients um, had improved uh, control. There was a lack of systemic side effects, which uh, anybody who's ever given uh, itraconazole um, realizes that it's very difficult to give it straight away for a good six months. It's probably almost impossible. Uh, but the logistics of uh, inhaled antifungals might um, interfere with using that um, as a therapy to control um, ABPA. Um, so this is um, kind of a slide compilation of all the um, available studies that have used um, inhaled um, amphotericin B um, as treatment um, for ABPA. And if you look at the number of patients, some of them are just one, three, five, seven. Uh, but they all had positive uh, effects uh, with their disease um, at the end of the day. So there's fair data um, to use um, inhaled corticosteroids. Um, so this is another study um, comparing the use of voriconazole and posoconazole, which are um, derivatives of itraconazole um, in patients with um, ABPA. Um, so what they did was they found 26 patients um, who had ABP and um, SAFs, which is uh, severe asthma with uh, fungal sensitization. It's pretty much a spectrum where uh, patients do not meet the, the diagnostic criteria for ABPA, but would um, um, have evidence of um, allergic uh, sensitization with um, high Ig levels. Um, all these patients had previously received itraconazole, but had been discontinued due to adverse effects. Um, these patients were treated with voriconazole or posoconazole for six months, and that dosing was adjustment with serum levels in this case. The target serum levels were the same for invasive aspergillosis. If that's appropriate, we really don't know. Um, I don't imagine that the serum levels needed to control in invasive aspergillosis and the uh, um, levels needed to control um, airway disorders are the same, but we really don't know that for a fact. Um, and this uh, pretty much was the um, results table. Um, most of the patients um, derived um, um, good treatment, uh, 17 out of 19, like we talked about. But if you look at the adverse effects and uh, those who had the medications uh, discontinued, um, I think those are pretty good rates. Um, zero out of um, three um, were discontinued at uh, 12 months. And uh, same thing for posoconazole, um, zero out of nine at uh, 12 months, which is fairly decent, uh, considering that about 40% of patients who receive itraconazole um, are not able to tolerate it. Um, in this study, um, there was better control of asthma in two-thirds of uh, patients, and 30 patients of study patients were able to completely discontinue 
um, oral um, um, corticosteroids. And uh, it was shown that use of voriconazole and posaconazole um, resulted in decrease in total IgE levels. You would expect that. Um, it was a retrospective study, and the uh, sample size was small. You only had uh, 26 patients. Um, but one benefit was that this time serum levels were monitored and, and targeted uh, for treatment. Um, then comes the next question. Um, what do we do with the um, anti-IgE um, uh, medications, uh, omalizumab? Um, so we had the study done at a uh, randomized uh, controlled trial um, with two treatment phases of two months or four months each with a three-month uh, washout period. Um, adult patients with poorly controlled ABPA uh, and symptoms um, were um, recruited. All the patients were also, also met um, diagnostic criteria for ABPA and uh, patients who had been on antifungal therapy were excluded. Um, patients who were on maintenance therapy for asthma um, was held during the duration of the study. And uh, patients were randomized to uh, use of uh, omalizumab or placebo. Now, um, at this point, I'll point out that the original studies for um, omalizumab in asthma was only for patients who had Ig levels between 30 and 700, which is kind of extremely low. Well, it's technically outside the um, diagnostic um, level for ABPA. Um, ABPA patients are characteristically over well over a thousand. Um, the primary endpoint was number of um, exacerbations during the treatment or placebo phase, and exacerbation was defined um, was no respiratory symptoms and needed oral corticosteroids. Um, secondary endpoints were also uh, monitored. And um, over here we have a table which kind of um, describes the um, the um, outcomes, and it turns out that uh, patients who uh, received the omalizumab had quite uh, reduced um, exacerbations and also had uh, decreased um, Ig um, levels as well. Um, so the points to take away were that um, omalizumab is um, an effective therapy for ABPA uh, with decreased rates of uh, exacerbations in the treatment phase. Um, of the 13 patients they had, 10 of them had levels that were much higher than you would ordinarily um, use omalizumab for. It's simply not indicated. There were no studies done in those kind of levels. There is no FDA approval for this indication, so it's not currently being used. Um, it's, a lot of people are looking at it, but it's not currently being used. And um, cystic fibrosis patients were excluded. Um, the only thing that shows a little bit of, not necessarily doubt on this um, study was that there were members of the investigating um, um, body that were involved with drug companies, but none of them was involved in the drug company that made omalizumab. So I don't imagine that they have any interest in promoting that medication. Um, in summary, um, ABPA is a chronic disease. It's almost impossible to get rid of altogether. Um, if you want to keep it simple, there are two things to target. Reduce inflammation, reduce fungal burden. However you achieve that, go for it. Um, and that's it. Here are my references. Any questions, please? Any questions?